thank you, thank you, and um, uh, good morning to everybody. Okay, um, this is a piece of research that was conducted uh, some time back, in a couple of years, uh, and we've just kept the um, momentum going uh, in relation to the so-called new Italian migration to Australia, which we put a question mark after because um, <coughs> we uh, we don't think that's the case. Myself and my colleague Riccardo Amile uh, have done um, a little bit of work around this, including the publishing of an edited book, of which I can see a few of uh, the contributors uh, in the audience. So this is what uh, I'd like to deal with. Um, to say that the whole issue of Italians, the new Italian generation coming to Australia, has created a great deal of debate, maybe expectations more than uh, more than warranted, uh, and. <coughs> Um, surprisingly, as we speak, um, the numbers uh, were declining in front of our very eyes uh, in relation to the different categories of visas, which the whole world of visas is in, is in topsy-turvy right now for a, a range of political reasons, uh, reasons related to uh, a new uh, ministry uh, of um, home affairs with um, Mr... Um, Mr. Strongman Dutton, who <laughs> is accumulating a lot of portfolios uh, and <coughs> is putting his mark, uh, his mark on, the, uh, on this question. Um, the interesting thing about Italian, um, let's call it migration just to avoid the whole debate because uh, we don't accept that, but uh, there's no other uh, term right now that comes to mind that we need to use, but the Italian migration um, uh, especially in the category of working, uh, working holiday makers, in fact, has declined significantly in the last three years, uh, and the decline appears to be a trend that will continue. Now, we're not sure why it's declined, but we've got our own um, reasons to speculate as to why that might be the case, and it may well be that social media is playing a role here, uh, that the word about the possibility of a future in Australia uh, is getting out, i.e. that there is none, and therefore uh, the young Italians are looking elsewhere for another place to, uh, to uh, seek opportunities. Um, so, uh, what we also discovered was that uh, when Italians were coming here, they were grasping onto straws to try and find a way of staying. Uh, and that also included uh, handing over a lot of money enrolling in numerous courses, changing, extend, doing bridging visas, and doing a lot of somersaults to try and stay. And many, uh, m most, uh, not many, most uh, failed uh, and eventually uh, had to return. And some of this will be uh, discussed also by my colleagues, and I'm very um, strongly supported in this panel by colleagues who've got a great deal of experience and, uh, and also research in relation to uh, the visa categories. And so this will be reinforced when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, as you hear the other presentations. The other point that I think was being made, and, and uh, <coughs> I hope my colleague uh, Michele Grigoletti is somewhere here, uh, is the comparison with uh, the 1950s and 60s. Now, there, there was some comparison for a short period of time. The numbers, all in the holiday making and the, and the skilled visa category, uh, was reaching some of those levels. But the big difference between the 1950s and 60s and today is that most of them had to return, uh, as opposed to the 50s and 60s where most were able to stay. Uh, and that created what we have here today, which is an Italian uh, community that resides in the different cities of Australia. Um, our research, uh, which was done through that, that institution under a great deal of scrutiny right now called Facebook, um, told us a lot of things about the new Italian generation. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but it's very different. Uh, first of all, they were mostly northerners as opposed to southerners. Uh, they were mostly uh, uh, educated as opposed to not being educated. They didn't go to Melbourne, they went to Sydney. So it kind of flipped over quite a lot of the uh, assumptions and stereotypes that we had in relation to the 1950s. Now, the so-called new migration story that there is uh, in relation to Italians coming to Australia, I think, can be framed in a bigger frame, in, a, in a bigger context. That Peter Maris is probably one of the best that's done some 
wonderful research in this area and only a few years ago, related to the fact that what Australia was producing was a large number of migrants who were in the temporary, uh, temporary visa category and with great difficulty were able to move away from the temporary to the permanent. And what he referred to was the creation of this large uh, group uh, of effectively um, without rights. Uh, migrants who were unable to change their status uh, and uh, were unable to um, seek guarantees and we won't even uh, touch on the 457 visas and I have colleagues who have been studying that uh, in, in more detail than I have. But you can see at the bottom, this was the reframing of the Australian migration approach on which Italians were getting caught up in. The, issue, the political issue related to having a large pool of people who are in a temporary status raises the very question of what kind of society you're creating and what rights do they have. Now, Australia always denied and always fought against in, in the context of so-called multiculturalism, which is another debate uh, uh, on its own, uh, in relation to um, never having a gastarbeiter, a temporary work pool that have no rights uh, along the lines that we see in a number of countries in the Middle East. And that this population would be integrated and would receive uh, all equal rights as per the multiculturalist approach. Well, I think the Italians are caught up in exactly the same problem uh, uh, in relation to not having those rights. And the numbers are starting to uh, uh, accrue to a level where we're talking uh, up to 800,000 uh, in the temporary, uh, temporary plus new migrants category um, number. And this is starting to get pretty, uh, pretty serious. So is there a politi political approach towards migration? Both sides of politics have um, shown both openness, bipartisan approach on the whole, um, and at the same time uh, supported the most despicable aspects of Australia's migration history, uh, white Australia being one of them. Um, interestingly, prior to the period of Whitlam, that we might look as a point of reference, migration was 189,000 a year, roughly the same lines as what we've got now. And thinking that Whitlam and, and Grasby, who were the supporters of migrants, didn't necessarily mean they were the supporters of migration. And in fact, in the period, the Whitlam period, which was my formative period politically, um, migration was its lowest since post-war period. Largely what the Whitlam government thought, I think, and Grasby, was that we need to worry about who's in country and try and reduce the amount of pressure that's coming in from outside. This was also coupled with the issue of Vietnam and the opposition of the, Vietnam, of the Australian government towards the so-called boat people from South Vietnam, later reversed by Fraser, uh, and today we have that community uh, that has settled into the big cities of Australia. So our migration has generally been very political. As I said a moment ago, the irony is that while we might complain as Italians and Italian community, migration is not declining. It's simply being refined and given a political direction. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the levels that the governments are talking about, on the whole, they haven't changed. It doesn't matter what Tony Abbott says, it doesn't matter what the others say, on the whole, it's remained uh, pretty much at the 180,000 mark. Uh, and the level of overseas representation of the population is just getting higher. In fact, I think Australia, if I'm not mistaken, has superseded Canada uh, as the number one country in the world with parents born overseas or one parent born overseas. Uh, and so it's starting to acquire a level where the issue of double citizenship for the politicians mm -hmm. they might want to give some thought to. And by the way, Michael Kirby, if anyone's paying attention, is making a very strong argument that we should be letting it happen. And by the way, the Italians in their, their election system have it as a de default that you can only be dual national in order to stand for the overseas colleges. So there's, a, there's an unusual um, dilemma, if you want. So what we have today in the migration system that many Italians are caught up is this two-step process of creating a temporary cate category and then a small number, very small number of Italians at least, 
um, are able to move to a permanent, uh, permanent position, which is exceptionally small. Um, many of the Italians that we're worried about, and this comes up in um, uh, concern by young, uh, new arrivals, is the inability to be given the opportunity to be able to uh, be given certainty, having to swap from one visa to another, uh, having to do fake courses, doing English classes, uh, and, and all the rest of it, um, we could see that there was a lot of clutching of straws here uh, in, in terms of its impact, particularly on Italians, but also many other, uh, let's call it European diaspora, um, that it certainly was uh, making itself felt. <coughs> Um, there was a moment when we were working with the comites, and I'm not too sure if there's is anyone here from the comites, uh, when we were trying to pressure the uh, Australian government into um, uh, giving a, a little bit of leeway in relation to European and Italians coming, uh, coming over and trying to find some kind of certainty. And one of the issues that cropped up is what level of uh, policy influence do Italian authorities in Australia, does Italy, uh, in terms of Australian uh, viewpoint, have in creating some weight and pressure in terms of change? And the problem is very little. And the historic relationship that there is between Italy and Australia is a very uh, poor uh, and very narrow and lean one. Um, I was struck, and I'll let you read <coughs> some of the stuff that, um, that, that, that is sort of a narrative to this, but I was struck when at a debriefing by the then David Ritchie ambassador, Australian ambassador to Italy, finishing up in December 9, uh, 2013 uh, with a very small audience, his view was there is no relationship between Australia and Italy. He just finished three years, he just completed his own mandate, he said I love the country and I've enjoyed my stay in Rome and I did this and I did that, but there's nothing there. Uh, and unfortunately for Italian authorities in Australia, we basically have the same issue in terms of being able to influence, other than through name and shame or shock and scandal, of which there is a little bit of leeway uh, if we were to look at some of the exploitation of Italian, young Italian uh, new arrivals in relation to the workforce. So the relationship has been defined for good or for bad by, by migration uh, and I don't think that that has changed. The other aspect is that Australian diplomatic representation in Italy, of which I was a member of it, uh, in uh, the 80s and 90s, is 50% of what it was. Uh, and uh, we're waiting for the day that the consulate will be shut in Milan and the Australian embassy in uh, Rome is, is living in a shoebox. Uh, with uh, very, very little uh, sway, interest, and uh, room for manoeuvre. Okay, in relation to what happens to the, the young Italians who come, these are the three areas, the three major areas that involve their attempted, uh, um, let's say, migration, um, and it's the working holiday that has played the biggest role. In the middle of last year, the Australian government announced a major reform of the visa structure. And I won't go into it, but all of it just smelled like more bad news. Uh, from the framing of the new visas, which would be economic and security, including using the recommendations from the Martin Place siege in Sydney of two years prior. Um, in discussions with colleagues, we realised that this was not a good look and whatever would come out of it would not be particularly helpful <coughs> in the improvement of the situation for young Italians coming. Um, what was the visa reform? And by the way, we still don't have the results yet. Um, was to reduce the visas from 99 to 9, I think it was, or 10, um, and uh, possibly um, merge, combine uh, a number of visas that were out there uh, various subclasses and so on and so forth, um, but no way was the question of Italians uh, anyway uh, in this kind of framework. All right, I better leave the politics, except for the South African farmers, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we can make fun of this, but the provisions that the government has in terms of visas always allows for, quote unquote, the emergencies. <laughs> 
uh, now, whether you want to put the uh, white South African farmers in that category. But we have a minister who's playing uh, very, uh, very hard, very tough, and um, uh, I don't think that uh, any representation to the minister will change, uh, even though we did submit a, uh, a uh, response to them uh, alongside the committees. The interesting thing I found was the question of raising the English level uh, to IELTS 6, um, which caused a great deal of uh, concern uh, for everybody uh, in the category of, uh, of uh, temporary and also permanent uh, visas. Um, and uh, I remember also <coughs> the, uh, the idea that we, we put some pressure on the Italian surname politicians. Uh, and I think that we got a very clear response on that front, which is bad luck. You've got to change with the times. And Piero Avanti Wells was one of them, uh, but not just her. Uh, so I don't think we can rely on any of that kind of Italian uh, support. Now, the working holiday visa. We've done our best to get the latest figures. But if you just look at the last column, so 3617, Look at Italy halfway down the page, and you can see that uh, it's not a great look. In fact, I can't see anything from here. Um, but yeah, so 11,000 going from a high level of 1516. This is where the idea was that uh, there was this massive jump in Italian migration, and I think you could probably say that the 11,000 probably will remain uh, like that in the immediate uh, future. So that's not a number that we can uh, give any kind of importance to in the sense that uh, we, we can make a case or a special case for Italians. Um, if we look at the former 457, um, also there, the numbers are very small. And I think the new, the new uh, we've got migration agents here. It's called the new skill. 482, subclass 482, TSS, temporary skill. Bit. Temporary skill, yes. And my understanding there also is that uh, some of the categories that Italians would have put applications into and probably been quite, quite uh, popular have been removed. Is that the case? No, I, look, I think the Italians are very adaptable. <laughs> they find an answer with a... Good agent or lawyer. Oh, oh, here's a bit of self publicity. <laughs> no, no, I promoted Manuel as well in front of me. Okay. Um, now, what they've done, because Italians won't be terribly affected, because a lot of them are involved in hospitality, and probably 12 to 15% of all hospitality workers are Italian. Uh, so, what's happened is that the government has got a temporary pathway, and after four years you go back home, and a permanent pathway. So, many. Most occupations were permanent, and as of April last year, we've got these two streams. So for chefs can be permanent in the country and in the city, mm -hmm. but cooks, pastry cooks, restaurant managers, uh, and pastry cooks can only be permanent in the country. Right. So what you do, you live in Werribee and get a job in Geelong. Right. So nothing's really changed. Okay. Mm. Thank the you. The Italians, because we're very <coughs> strong in the hospitality sector. Great. Thank you for that. Student visas, um, we've got the um, last figure for 216.17, and, and uh, we're talking about pretty small numbers. So it's very difficult to make uh, a case uh, in relation to um, the, the respective categories, and even if we could once upon a time for the uh, working holiday, that seems to be on the decline. This is the list in terms of uh, the net, uh, the country of birth of, uh, pop of, um, of incoming um, migrants, and it tells you where the real priorities are. Uh, India, China, clearly up there uh, with um, a lot of New Zealand. Okay, the Italians are still the largest from, from continental Europe. Sure, absolutely, but it's based on the the um, uh, on the history. Now, let me just finish up because I think I need to. Uh, I'm, I'm going over my time, and I just want to just some summary points. Um, so. If we look at uh, the period of the late 40s until, uh, until um, say, 69, and really the period is 51 to 69, um, the average number coming in was about 11,000. Um, and at its peak, between 54 and 61, it got to uh, around 15, which were large numbers. And if you start accumulating over a period of time, uh, it, it brings that uh, community uh, largesse, if you want. And most Italians uh, arrived and stayed, uh, became residents, uh, and most, in fact, then became citizens. Um, 
So we were basing the possibility that something was new and happening on the, the fact that working holidays in fact reached 15,000 um, but did not stay there. Uh, and since then, since about 2013, in fact has been declining and we've got 11,000 now. Um, so an important f factor here is that <coughs> One of the uh, aspects of the current, uh, the new migration, if we, if we call it that, is that there is no, it's, it's a kind of haphazard, it's anarchic, it's, it, just, it just happens, there's no framework, there's no legal agreement, there's no treaty, uh, as there was uh, in the 1950s, as difficult and as incomplete as it was. Uh, it still provided a framework and also protection, uh, of which the Italian government used and a number of occasions um, recalled the Australian government to uh, ensure that they respected the agreement. Um, and unfortunately, the amount of, of Italians that come here uh, that are able to stay is literally tiny uh, compared to the way it was uh, in the uh, previous period. Um, so I think we could say that the arrival of Italians has really very much got an uncharted uh, nature to it, left to their own devices, no kind of real organised support, there's no framework to give uh, help or assistance, whether it be for the day-to-day -day needs or even, even the visa system, except to go to um, migration agents to get their visa sorted out. But we know that it's very complex and in great contradiction. At the same time, the Ministry of uh, whatever you want to call it, Home Affairs and Immigration and so on, um, has adopted, and I'm hearing this from my colleagues and migration agents and also many applicants, uh, that it, there's a bunker mentality, that it, there's a, a complete uh, lack of desire to communicate, to assist, uh, and therefore very, um, very difficult to negotiate with. Information is very unreliable, it's very informal. We have the wonderful efforts of the NUMIT to try and help uh, the uh, young, uh, young and new arrivals, but that's so. Uh, vo it's a volunteer-based organisation, uh, and frankly, very, uh, in, um, uh, let's say, uh, not not particularly complete. We're hearing many, many cases of exploitation, uh, and uh, across many uh, segments of the visa structures, and uh, and of course, we're seeing uh, some activity and a behaviour which is not particularly. Um, particularly nice or even legal. Um, recognition of qualifications is another issue that's cropped up. It's a lot more complex than what it appears. Uh, in actual fact, uh, Italians have been under a false illusion that these things are decided by government. Uh, in reality, it's all decided by private associations and it's government that simply just gives the rubber stamp on them. Uh, and unfortunately, Australia lives in one professional world as opposed to Italy which lives in another professional world so they don't actually, um, uh, their paths don't meet. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically it. Um, all of these recommendations and ideas that we that were presented particularly on the last slide were offered to the government in the review that they uh, undertook. In, this was in conjunction with the Committee for Italians Abroad, the Comites, uh, and we uh, haven't heard any word uh, in relation to that. Um, and I'm not uh, sort of holding my breath that we're going to get much conclusion out of it. Thank you for listening.